Okay, good. So you need to hit continue to keep that going. And um, let's go ahead and do a couple of things here at the start. Um, I want to take a look first at the syllabus, which I have revised and posted the revised version based on our conversation last time. Uh, as I mentioned, I really would like to get through uh, chapter four today. Um, if we have some left over, then I've made a provision for um, Thursday, going ahead and um, finishing up chapter four on Thursday, and then uh, getting through uh, chapter five on Thursday. If we are efficient and we're able to get through chapter four today, uh, we may be able to look at chapter five and six on Thursday. And if we do that, then I would go ahead and put chapter six on our midterm, which my notes indicated we had agreed we would do that on the 15th. Um, that takes some of the pressure then off of the final and that we don't have to have as many chapters uh, on the final. If not, and we can sort of decide on that next time, whatever, um, then we can go ahead and, uh, <clears throat> you know, move chapter six, keep chapter six as it's, as it's noted here on the final and then so forth. And I think this is pretty much what we had agreed on kind of come to, I don't know about agreed, but we felt that this was the best way to approach things based on my notes from our conversation last time. Did I miss anything? Nope. Okay, good. So that's the... Um, Can we have this posted, Professor? Yeah, I just posted it today. Uh oh, thank you. If you haven't looked today, you probably haven't seen it yet, Gary. Um, so look again. I did have a question, Professor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, what was the uh, circumstances for the final again? Just to be clear. Uh, I think 427 is the last day we were scheduled for class, right? Mm -hmm. um, let me look at the calendar. So that's a Tuesday. Um, Depending on how strict they get on the grade, okay, so I don't want to commit completely to this yet, because for you guys, sometimes they're after me like a cheetah to get me to get the grades done. Um, but what I'll do, and I think this is what we talked about last time, but I can't remember now. Um, I'll open it like Monday and leave it open till like maybe uh, Sunday night, May 2nd, so that you have a full week to work it. Um, hmm. Yeah, it, 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 assuming they don't say to me, well, you have to have the grades by May 3rd or something stupid like that. They give me a little bit of room. I'll just give you a full week to work the final. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll just open it and you have a full week. You pick the date. For the midterm, I'll open it. I'll try to have it open by, um, I'll open it by Thursday, the 15th, 12 a.m. And I'll close it. When do we reconvene? on the 20th, I'll close it like just before class starts on the 20th. Does that sound like, the sound? that sounds pretty good. If I was taking this class, I'd be happy. What do you think? Yes, that's great. Yeah, so I'll open it. I would say, well, I'll open it that whole week, but we're, we still have, I still wanna spend some time with you prior to turning you loose on that. So <clears throat> I'll open it the 15th, 12 a.m. I'll close it just before we meet on the 20th. In fact, maybe we'll have some time to review some of the questions at that point, right after. The, but you know, don't do me a favor, guys. I always get one or two students, not my, not my master students, but I always get one or two undergraduate students, particularly in introductory classes. 
it's like life is too boring to them unless they wait up to the last minute before the test closes on them. And then they end up in a dilemma and they want me to start doing magic tricks to open things back up for them and change the whole world for their kind of weird situation. And I'm not the best guy at that kind of stuff. Um, so, you know, when I say I'll close it on Tuesday at 1.30 on the 20th, you know, have it done like, I got two 420s in here, don't I? I think it's because you originally had the test on that day and just forgot to change that. What did I do? You had the, the second midterm on 420. So we were going to do the midterm in the first half of class and then the chapters in the second half. So that's why they were originally two 420 dates on the calendar. And it looks like when you updated it, you just forgot to reflect the dates in that change. Okay, but I still have two 420s, don't I? Four fifteen, okay. We reconvene on four twenty. So we have to do this on four twenty two, right? Am I missing something? Well, is the mid is, is our first midterm going to take us the entire class? I was going to give you the whole week. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, let's get going because we probably got to get chapter six done. Yeah. Um, so that means we'll be doing all of this chapter 14. We're, we're going to be busy on the 22nd. Ugh. I don't know why they do this to you guys. They make this almost impossible to get everything in. So I really don't even need this up here, other than to say what the name of the uh, chapter is. So, okay, well let's let's keep going, guys. In terms of exams, let's stick with four fifteen. I'll do it as I said. I'll open it on Thursday morning. We have until the twentieth to get it done the 20th, we'll see where, how, where we land and we'll go from there, okay? Just, I don't know, it's kind of impossible almost to fit everything in the way we want to, but okay. Question guys? Okay, let's go ahead and jump in. Then uh, the other administrative thing and I'm just going to close this. I'll save it. I'll fix it later. Uh, I had a quick question. That's all right. Um, uh -huh. So are exams done through lockdown browser or anything specific that we need, like a webcam, or is it just log in Canvas normally and then take it? Just log into Canvas and take okay. it. Um, you know, there's some people that would say I'm violating some stupid thing, but, you know, I'm not inclined to sit here and watch your eyes while you're taking the test with your camera on. And the whole notion of lockdown browsers is a little silly because everybody has more than one device. So while you would maybe in a lockdown browser on the computer you're taking the test on, it doesn't prevent you from seeing whatever you want on your other machine, right? Um, so I'm not a big fan of it. So no. Um, announcements. Let's see if it's going to let me open this. I always have trouble opening my own announcement for some bizarre reason. Here we go. Um, Becker came through for us. So we will have the FAR section where you can review that for five months. Okay, we'll turn off on you after five months. So if you click on this, 
you know, and it looks kind of funny, like, oh, okay, they're going to charge me or something. Don't give them any money. Okay, give me a chance to just see what I'm looking at before you ask me for feedback. Um, but just go ahead and uh, click on this and go through the registration process. And that'll give you access to the FAR section for one month. I mean, for five months. And then the, um, the relevant chapters are those same chapters that we posted up as the required reading. Um, so you have the PDF for the book in, um, in Canvas. Okay, so um, did I put those chapters up? Supplemental reading, required reading, whatever. So the relevant chapters are chapter nine, chapter eight, chapter nine, and chapter 10. Uh, chapter eight is where the not-for-profit stuff is. Chapters nine and 10 are where the governmental are. Okay, so I guess we can go ahead and move that up. I said I can move that up. I said I can move that up. Okay, question. Okay, good. So we've got our books in order. I think the only question is how we're going to cover everything there towards the end. But uh, I think our best bet is to just keep moving forward and see where we end up. So I want to come back to chapter 4A and again, the uh, sort of definitive slide for chapter 4a is this one where we talk about revenue recognition remember revenue recognition changes depending on the revenue type and then um, we have the rules here examples the type of requirement whether it's a time requirement and or time and eligibility and then we have um, the fact that these are the rules for accrual accounting, which we would use at the government-wide level, whereas if we're dealing with our uh, governmental fund financial statements, general fund, special revenue fund, debt service fund, capital project fund, then our modified accrual rule would say, hey, we're adding to time and that it has to be collectible within. And in this class, we always use 60 days as our criteria, collectible within 60 days of the balance sheet. Uh, then it can be recounted as revenue also for modified accrual. If we go outside that 60 days, then it becomes a revenue of that next year when it's finally collected. Okay, so we talked about derived non-exchange. Remember, derived non-exchange is determined by some underlying transaction. So it derives its amount by the underlying transaction or when it's recognized as derived by when the underlying transaction took place. For example, sales taxes, we recognize the revenue when the sale takes place. And we went through a detailed example there that showed how if you have amounts that the sale took place in the fiscal year, you take the revenue for accrual. Only difference was modified accrual. So if we had some collections in the example we had with sale tax, falling outside of the 60 days, then that would become the revenue of the year in which it was collected. Imposed non-exchange means that the government comes and tells you the amount of revenue. Classic example there is property taxes. Okay, so the government says, this is the value of your home. This is the amount of property tax you're gonna have to pay us. And so we said there that the only consideration was time and it was when use may begin. And we had an example where we had to wait until we entered into the year. And I gave you a long example there that's on uh, Canvas that talks about when the money can start to be used. If we have already mailed out the tax bills and um, we haven't entered the period yet in which the money can be used, it's deferred inflow. Once we entered into that year for full accrual anyway, um, it became revenue once we entered the year when use may begin. Let's see the revenue recognition rule. And then again, for the modified accrual, and I think we went through a long, remember we went through a long example just to at the end end up 
um, saying that amounts that fell outside of the 60 days would be a revenue in that period that it was collected as opposed to a revenue for the year in which use may begin, looking at our modified accrual. That was sort of where I think we left off. So before we um, jump in with some new stuff, any question on that so far? Okay, good. So then we talked about uh, imposed non-exchange and we started talking about fines. Okay, so when use may begin, that was for our property taxes. For fines and penalties, it's when the government has a legally enforceable claim. So the government has to actually be able to say, hey, you have been adjudicated guilty. We are now hitting you with this fine, with this penalty, whatever it is. That's when they can recognize the revenue. Now, let me ask you this. If the government finds you and you pay them, are you basically saying that you agree with their finding? No. No? So you go ahead and you pay the government and then you go and fight them after they already have your money? Uh, no, actually I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much, unless you were trying to get, <laughs> You know, it's just uh, Brandon, well, you, worked, you worked for IRS at one time, right? One point in time, did you tell us? So you don't have to answer that. Oh, no, that was uh, Spencer that worked for the IRS. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, you know, there are times where entities will pay the tax that the IRS is saying that they're due, and they pay it because they want to get the case out of the tax court and want to get into the district court. But for the most part, most entities, they're not going to pay a fine or a penalty or whatever unless they've already exhausted their due process, right? So for practical purposes, the government looks at that and they say, if somebody pays the fine or penalty, then they are basically saying that we have a legal claim and they go ahead and recognize the revenue upon the payment. Now, there could be, though, that what somebody disputes the amount that they owe. And if that's the case, the government is going to have to wait until it actually lets that person go through the due process to see if they have a legally enforceable claim. Okay. So what I want to do is go ahead. Huh? Oops. I thought I was on an earlier slide. Is just look right here. Okay. I'll put this back in the slideshow. Okay. Just look right here. And notice that what's going on here is we have this, let me go back one more. We have this situation, the city poses a fine on parked vehicles. The fine is $100 upon discovery and $50 an hour each after hour after the vehicle continues to block the fire hydrant, whatever. Fines are assessed by enforcement officers who issue citations for the infraction. Violators have 30 days to either pay or appeal the citation. How will the city apply revenue recognition? Okay, so we look and we have this person that on December 1st, they parked their car and then they were given the $100 discovery and then $50 for failure to move. So they have a total citation of 150. Now the person pays the 100, but apparently they're saying, hey, I owe the 100, but I moved my car and I can prove that and I'm gonna have my day in front of the judge when I'm gonna go ahead and dispute this, okay? So what happens? The 100, they take as revenue, but because we haven't exceeded the 30 day period or maybe by now the person has already gone ahead and appealed, um, they don't take that $50, they're gonna to have to wait and eventually they will either not take this revenue if the person wins, or if the government has a legally enforceable claim, that's the time. So if that falls into the next year here, then that will be revenue of the next year because that's when the government had a legally enforceable claim will be in that next year. Okay. Question? Uh, yeah, I had one. Um, just, I guess, out of curiosity, since I guess they can't recognize revenue until there's a legally enforceable claim. Do they ever, do they have an account that's like, uh, oh, this is money that we have in, but it's not 
legally we don't have a claim on it yet or is it money, just money or violations I, I guess violations yeah oh yeah they would have an accounting somewhere right try and get have you ever gotten a ticket i'm trying to get rid of them without yeah so i'm sure they have some sort of system you know that sits there and will keep sending out notices and stuff but from an accounting standpoint you know, they're not going to be able to take their revenue. I mean, probably that system, I would imagine that system feeds the accounting system at some point in time. Someone's paid. This is now the revenue that we can recognize, or there's been an adjudication, book the receivable, and take the revenue. And then it's probably a separate system that keeps sending out the notices hey, you haven't paid your parking ticket or whatever it is. Got it. Good to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Professor Lord, mm -hmm. at this point, does it meet neither the time or the eligibility requirement for the well, $50? We only, worry, we only worry about time here, okay? So when we're talking about, I guess I'll go down this way, I don't know what's the fastest path, up or down. When we're talking about imposed, then oh, eligibility see. is not an issue, okay? So it's a time, and the time is, and I know it, it gets a little hard to kind of wrap your head around, but the time is the time when the government has a legally enforceable claim. So I kind of hear your question. Well, yeah, but you weren't really eligible for that. Well, yeah, but we didn't take any revenue at all until we determined we had a legally enforceable claim. So we didn't do anything. We didn't take deferred inflow, nothing, until we finally got to what legally enforceable claim the time when that legal enforceable claim comes in, that's when you take the revenue. Okay, so it's not a deferred inflow or a liability at this point? Well, it wouldn't be a liability until unless they sent me, unless someone just mysteriously sent me some money and yeah. did something wrong at some point in time. That makes sense. So, I'm, I'm trying to think about yeah. the Caterpillar pupa butterfly example that you gave yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, it's not no, even a category. No pupa here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's once you have the legally enforceable claim. With the other one, the property taxes and the sales taxes, we had uh, potential of deferred inflow. Um, although, to be honest with you, for the derived, the, the only way you could really end up with a deferred inflow is if we had... Um, you know, that situation where the sale had already taken place, but we hadn't collected all the money yet. Um, and so it, the money fell outside the 60 days. But it's kind of, in those cases, you're kind of getting a deferred inflow um, because you know, because of there's like that is suspended animation thing where you're gonna be able to prepare the financial statements, but you know some amounts fell out inside the 60 days. So you go ahead and you report the deferred inflow at the uh, fund level because you know some amounts fell outside the 60 days because you issued your financial statements after the 60 days. Does that make sense? Yes, I remember that example. Yeah, so that's how you end up with deferred inflow there. So really where deferred inflow is coming in right now is in this imposed uh, non-exchange uh, where use may not begin, but we've already sent out the tax bills, right? Because we don't want to wait to the day before we're able to start to use the money to send out the tax bills. So they levy the tax in 2020, but use may not, and some people send that money in or we have the receivable, we have to debit receivable or debit cash. We have to credit something, we credit deferred inflow and then once we enter the year, at least for full accrual, we take the entire revenue. And then as a practical purpose for our um, modified accrual, we're just sort of taking the money as we collect it, waiting to see if any amounts fall out of the 60 day uh, window, right? And then we start getting into, again, that suspended animation thing. We'll know what amounts were collected after the 60 days because uh, we don't issue the financial statements until probably 90 days after. Okay, thank you. Okay, 
But no, the government just assumes it's eligible to at least try to find you. <laughs> you know, if you win the case, then they say, well, we don't have a legally enforceable claim, so we're never going to take the revenue on that. Um, so, so until it's legally enforceable, it's just like not on their books as a revenue item. It's not on their books, period. It's neither an asset nor a liability, deferred inflow or, in deferred inflow or a revenue. Okay. Nothing. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Good, good questions. Okay. Question. We can go to government mandated. Okay. Now government mandated, okay, is when a higher level of government directs the activities of the lower level of government and um, basically uh, says we'll fund that. Okay, so what happens? I'm the state and I tell the state, county, you have to clean up any pollution that occurs in your county. You have to clean that up. And here's the money to clean that up, say water pollution. Now, why does the state have the right to tell a county what to do? Because the I guess the state's higher up in the totem pole, so to speak. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, we're not, you know, we're not going to have anarchy. And so our system allows states to tell counties within their borders what to do. But it makes sense at a higher level. And there's probably something constant, you know, states, constitutions, whatever about counties. Look, I can't let your city, your county mess things up because you're neighboring to what? another county when it comes to things like pollution and whatnot you know it could mess up another county right so the state says over there and says we're going to keep our state clean if there are groundwater issues and stuff you got to clean it but to keep our state clean here's some money to go ahead and help you with that mandate that you have to clean things up whatever um i always think it's kind of like the um i don't know if you guys ever watched the movie the godfather where the godfather he gives somebody some money and says, so long as your interests don't conflict with our interests, we'll fund this problem, whatever, right? Of course, when you see that in the movie, you know that their interests are going to conflict and that's going to be the point of the whole movie, right? <laughs> okay, but what happens here, they're giving them the money, right? Now, what they'll often say is we're going to give you this money, but you can't use that money until the state's fiscal year begins, okay? Well, if that's the case, then we're going to have to what? We're going to look at time and we're going to have to wait before we take that as a revenue. We're gonna to have to wait until the state's fiscal year begins in that example, okay? So when use may first begin, then we're going to sit here and say, well, whenever the state tells us we can start to use that money and often they gear that money to their fiscal year. Now, um, eligibility, only becomes relevant when we're dealing with a uh, reimbursement. So the, the uh, state government says, and sometimes the federal government will do this too, but let's just stick with the state. The state government says, hey, after you spend the money to do this cleanup, then we'll give you the money to cover your costs. Well, you don't become eligible until you do what? Until you spend the money. So finally, eligibility we have an example if you have to spend the money first in order to be eligible for the money uh, then of course you're not eligible until you spend that money now before i know it's a little unclear right now and this is just a summary table now remember so before we do that let's just look here and we have government mandated okay and of course these are all non-exchange so what we're talking about right now are the government mandated, okay? Government mandated when the higher level of government tells the lower level of government, state tells the county to do something, okay? Now we say what? We say that we have time requirements and it says when the grant must be used or when use may begin, okay? So what happens? We come over and let's say county, a, okay, County A has a fiscal year 
that starts on January 1st. Well, I guess that'd be a calendar year, January 1st, 2020. And it ends 1231. 2020, let's say, and I'll just use 2020 in this example, okay? Now let's say the state is going to send some money down to the county, but the state's fiscal year starts 7 1 2020. And they tell them that that money has to be used in what? Has to be used in the state's fiscal year. So from the county standpoint, what's going to happen? Let's say, just for fun, let's say they get that money in June 2020. Well, if they get that money in June 2020, and I'll just assume it's a million dollars, of course, they would debit cash a million. They'll probably give them a lot more than that. And they'll credit deferred inflow for a million dollars. Because what? The state's fiscal year has not begun yet, right? It's going to get it June 1st because the state's not going to wait till the last minute to give it to them, whatever, right? Then we hit 7 1 2020. Has the state's fiscal year begun? Yes. At that point, the state's fiscal year has begun, right? Now, your accountant instinct is to say, oh, well, I can only take half that because they're going to spend the remainder of that, what, they have probably half of that they're going to spend in what, in up until June 30th of 2021, because they have to spend it within the state's fiscal year, right? That's not how we do it. As soon as we hit 7-1, we do what? We debit deferred inflow for the full million and credit the revenue. Why? Because the requirement was that the state's fiscal year had to begin. State's fiscal year has begun. So now use may begin, period in which the grant must be used. We have entered that period now. And so we can go ahead and take the revenue. So it's sort of like much ado about nothing. At the end of the day, although you've learned something, I think, oh, okay, we don't sit there and allocate it half and half. And the reason Gasby does this is they look and they say, well, the amounts that come in in these government mandates where the higher level government mandates with the lower level government does, it's not like there's these wide variations from period to period. So it really doesn't hurt anything if you take some money that you're really using in that next fiscal year account for this revenue here, because next year, what's gonna happen? Well, you'll get some more money next year and that more money that you get next year, you'll spend what? half of it in the fiscal year that you're in and then half in that next fiscal year. So that rolling amount doesn't make a whole big difference. And so they just tell you, take it when use may begin all of it. Question? Now, again, that is still a time requirement. So when do we get into an eligibility requirement? And for government mandated, which is where we're at right now, we're still talking about government mandated, reimbursement, okay? So now we finally get into what? We finally get into eligibility. You haven't met the eligibility requirement until you do what? Until you spend the money. So if you spend some money, you go ahead and you debit expenditure for say a million and you're going to credit cash for a million. Have you met eligibility? Have you met eligibility if it's a reimbursement? Yes. Yes. You've met eligibility. Good. Because you just had to spend the money to be eligible. So now I'll debit grant receivable for a million and I credit what? I credit revenue because there is no time requirement now. They didn't say, hey, you know, spend the money and then, you know, you have to enter some period or something. If it's simply spend the money, we'll reimburse you. You go straight to revenue unless we get back into what? 
the suspended animation thing and we're at the fun level and for some reason I've already spent the money and they're not going to reimburse me until after the 60 days, let's say. Well, then if that's the case, then I guess at the fun level, I could have a modified accrual, but I got to tell you, I mean, uh, under modified accrual, I could have a deferred inflow, but I got to tell you that that would be kind of weird if they're making me wait that long that now all of a sudden I'm having to take deferred inflow for a reimbursement type grant. Question? So you're looking at this and the feeling that you're getting is, you know, John, eligibility is a waste of time. I mean, why do they even have eligibility here? If the only time it became relevant was you had to spend the money to be eligible for the money, right? And the practical matter, it does what? It just ends up going straight to revenue as soon as you spend the money. So why do they make an issue out of eligibility? And it really comes in for the voluntary non-exchange situation now, okay? What happens? Well, now I'm asking that higher level of government for money, but I'm probably on one bended knee saying, please approve my project for some federal funding, okay? So like example, uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, okay? Um, they sometimes will look at a project that's going to do some sort of improvement in the county that needs some, um, you know, some funding to help in, um, you know, um, disadvantaged neighborhoods or something like that, right? And so the county will say, well, what we're going to do is we're going to build this housing complex and whatnot, and we want to be approved for this project by HUD to get some funding. And sometimes this HUD funding is important because it'll be for a vital piece of the pie that maybe they can't get through private financing or something. And HUD comes in with some money to get them started, that kind of thing. Well, what HUD does is they get all of these requests and they go through and they rank the request and they approve the list until they run out of money to give to these entities. So there's a competitive bid process going on and I don't know if I'm gonna be approved for that, right? So as soon as HUD approves me, am I eligible? If HUD says, John, it's 2020 and here's, you have, you have won and we're gonna send you $100,000. Have I, and you can spend that money in 2021. What should I do in 2020? I'm, I'm hesitant to say recognizes as revenue, but. Uh... Well, I'm eligible. You're right. I'm eligible, right? Because they told me I won. Yeah. I put in the best proposal they've seen in years and they're going to go ahead and give me, you know, a million dollars. HUD is. But but the timing isn't there, right? Right, I've met eligibility, very good, but not what, but not time. So I may debit, I can go ahead and debit if they've told me, hey, you've won, we're gonna send you the money. And is the federal government good for, does the federal government have good credit? Right now, yeah. <laughs> The day they don't, brother, load your shotgun up. <laughs> the day the federal government doesn't have good credit anymore, everyone's coming for you. Didn't we go from like AAA to like AA or something? Didn't that, wasn't that like oh, a big yeah. thing that happened years ago? <laughs> they did that. That's nonsense. Yeah, they did that. That had more to do with politics than finances. Let me ask you, do you know of an entity that could have borrowed money at a lower interest rate? <laughs> so if that's not telling you that, that an entity has a good credit rating, that they can borrow money at what is defined as the risk-free rate of return? During the financial crisis, um, basically what people were doing was they were bidding on treasury bill notes and bonds and they were bidding for a negative return on those. 
they were bidding for a negative return on those. In other words, they were going to pay the federal government to hold their money. Now, the reason they did this is they knew that there was competitive bids going on for those treasuries. And so they wanted to make sure that they won. So they were basically bidding a negative return. Now, it turned out that the return on those, and it's still very low, was like 1% or something stupid like that, 1.5%, whatever it was. And so what happens, they knew that they would win the bid by bidding a negative return. They were going to pay the federal government to hold their money because at least they could control their losses when everything was spiraling, spiraling down out of control. So even though you look and you see these deficits and you see what you see the debt and you hear all this about how the government's going to run out of money in that, but there's some sort of what there's some sort of faith in this thing that keeps going called the federal government called the United States of America that people are willing to step up and bid on and the day that you can't trust your money there anymore is a very different day I say load your shotgun first of all I don't have a shotgun you may not either but it's a day when you know things will change radically and uh, we'll have to you know, kind of change all kinds of way we do things. And accounting will probably be the last of our problems. Okay, so what happens? Um, we still believe that the federal government has a good faith, good faith, you know, uh, credit. And so we figure they're going to pay us. So we go ahead and we debit the grant receivable. But this is in 2020. So we're going to do what? We're going to credit deferred inflow because they said we can't use the money until what? That's a million dollars credit for deferred inflow because they say we can't use that money until we enter into what? 2021, 2021, now what? Now we can debit deferred inflow a million and now we credit the revenue. So finally what? Eligibility and time has finally become interesting to us, right? Where we went from a deferred inflow because we had met eligibility, but not time. And then we went from a deferred inflow to revenue when we met the time requirement. Of course, eventually they'll go ahead and they'll send me the cash. I'll debit cash. I'll credit the grant. That's a million. I'll credit the grants receivable. And then presumably at some point I'll start spending that money. Question. Okay, good. So let's go ahead then and let's look at this question. And guys, you will find this question in Becker, which is where I stole this from, I borrowed this from. So you'll see this question there, but I think it does a nice job of now touching all three bases as we go from a uh, def uh, unearned revenue, a liability to what? Deferred inflow to revenue. Okay, so let's just look at this and we've got this uh, progressive township community college received a 900,000 multi year research grant available for use on a pro rata basis over the next three years subject to other enrollment based uh, eligibility requirements. Okay, at the end of year one of the grant, the college had achieved enrollment levels that satisfied the grant eligibility requirements equal to 500,000. Is all the transaction the community college would recognize, and it's a what multi year grant to be recognized over three years. So we've got time, we've got eligibility. Now, just take a look down here uh, at the solution part here, and you can see that we have what total amount received is 900,000. Okay. Now, we have met the requirements for time, 900,000 divided by three. We've met the requirements for 300,000 for time. So we can take that as revenue because the question also tells me that I have met eligibility for what? The enrollment requirements for 500,000. So there's that 500,000, the amount I've recognized as revenue because I've met eligibility and time for up to 300,000. That difference is 200,000, that's what? That's deferred inflow because I've met eligibility but not time. And then what? The amounts that have never, ne neither met eligibility nor time are what? Are an unearned revenue, that's a liability.
Okay. Question. Okay, good. So when you look at all this, guys, I know it's like a bunch of different rules sort of flying around at first, but I think once you've kind of reviewed these things again and we look at some of the questions and see how it works and you keep working with them, we'll look at the practice midterms next time. I think you'll see, okay, I got this. This is not the hardest thing. I'd rather look at this than how to account for you know foreign currency transactions, okay? which is something that's, you know, well outside the subject of this class. Um, but, you know, still, you may have run into that. That gets a little funkier. Or, you know, I'd rather do this in a consolidation. Okay, question. Okay, for a charge for service, once the government provides a service, it can take the revenue. And this really comes more in our, um, our enterprise funds. So what happens? Enterprise fund, like um, in the Bay Area bridges are enterprise funds. You pay the toll, you recognize the revenue uh, when you uh, cross the bridge. Oh, I did forget one thing going back um, to our fines and penalties are imposed right here i just realized i forgot this okay things like driver's license okay occupational licenses building permits that sort of thing um you can take the revenue as soon as the individual can engage in the activity that you've licensed them for so if you pay your driver's license fee when can you begin driving Right when you get your driver's license? Yeah, when you get the license, right? I mean, you they, they don't take the fee from you unless you pass the test, right? <laughs> then you get to go in there when you first get your license, when you're 16, whatever. Um, although years back, probably about six, seven years ago, uh, my dad got his last driver's license and so I took him to the DMV and they made him take the test because you get past a certain age, you have to take the test. And the poor guy, you know, is kind of starting to lose his, you know, ability to pass tests and stuff. He was in his 80s already, I think. And um, so he goes up and I see him go up to the window and they correct his test. And I guess he missed too many because his shoulders kind of slumped down. And now it's role reversal. The kid sitting there watching the dad go up and get his license. And then the guy basically turned the thing over and asked some questions, said, answer these questions on the other side. And so he answered the questions on the other side and got them right. And so we were, oh, okay. And we went and we had you know, lunch and we're all happy that he passed his last driving test. When he came eligible again, we decided, yeah, dad, it's time to stop driving. So he didn't drive again after that. But uh, they don't make you pay the fee until what? Until you pass the test. You pass the test and they make you pay the fee and you got a driver's license and you can drive, right? Some things like, uh, say, an occupational license will say, well, you will be able to practice business in this uh, city next year. Now, let's say you pay that in 2020 and it allows you to do business in 2021. So the government gets some cash, so they debit cash, which should they credit? Unearned revenue or that might be wrong. <laughs> well, I guess something no, unearned or deferred. Huh? I, I, I'm guessing something unearned or deferred since you haven't earned the license yet. Okay. No, so I want I want a license to do business in the city of Hayward. Okay, and so I got to pay the fee to engage in business, whatever it is in the city of Hayward. I'm going to open up a business um, selling ice cream cones. Okay, so I have to have a business permit to open that business, and it allows me to start doing business in January of 2021. But I pay the fee in November. And it says you are now eligible to start doing business in the city of Hayward in 2021. Now, when I hand Hayward that money, they're going to debit cash, aren't they? 
What are they going to credit? Deferred inflows. Good. They're going to credit deferred inflow because what? The activity that I'm licensed to do won't start until that next year, right? Then when we enter into what? When we rent enter into um, 2021, now the government has met the time requirement, debit deferred inflow credit the revenue. As a government, it doesn't ask itself, am I eligible to tax John to do business? They know they're eligible to do it, but what? It's the time that it allowed me to engage in activity that started that next year, okay? With a driver's license, it was a little different because what? You don't typically get a driver's license and they say, okay, now walk home because you can't start driving until next year. You can drive immediately. So in that case, it never stops at deferred inflow. It goes straight to the revenue, right? Okay, so you can see this example, City of Hayward sends out billings for business licenses in November, 2014, for 870,000 allow companies to do business in Hayward in 2015. Hayward collects 300,000 of this by 12, 31, 14. How much revenue should they take? Answer is what? Zero. They debit what? They debit license receivable, 870,000. Credit deferred inflow, okay? Then what? For the amount that they got, and I think I missed this up. For the amount that they got, they would do what? Debit cash, 300,000. Credit the receivable, right? Then what do they do in 2015? I know 2015 is past. What do we do in 2015? Is your debit? Uh, deferred inflow and credit revenue. How much? Is it just that 300,000? No. Well, or, I, I see what, uh, let, let's do government wide, okay? Just follow the accrual rules. I see why you're saying under modified accrual, you want to wait because you want to see if they collect it within the 60 days of 2015. Yeah. Let's just do the accrual rule here. So it would be for all of it, the 870? Yeah. It says it lets me do business in what year? 2015. We're in 2015, aren't we? Under this example, it's not really 2015. When I did this example, it was 2015. Okay. So if they receive the cash, but the uh, license isn't earned yet. Can they still use the cash or do they need to wait for the license to be earned until they use the cash? Um, well, I mean, you know, they, they have all kinds of money in their bank account, right? Yeah. You know, so um, they, they would spend the cash, you know, as soon as they got it probably, but from a, um, from a budgeting standpoint, you know, whatever these monies are earmarked for, um, you know, I better not, you know, have some obligation to perform some kind of activity, say in December, and I'm out of money for that in, you know, in June, because that sound you hear is the government managers getting fired, right? <laughs> So, you know, you get the money now, but if you're supposed to buy money for food for kids throughout the year, you better not blow through all of your money for that in June. So you would have a budgeting issue, but the cash probably all, you know, goes into one bank account, right? Gotcha. So in 2015, do we also debit cash 570 and credit license fee receivable 570? When I get the money. Okay. If I get the money in 2015, yeah. I mean, I can't debit cash until I got the cash, right? So if I get all the money in 2015, then I can debit cash and credit the receivable, yeah. 
once I get the money. And then from a modified accrual standpoint, let's say I get some of that money in March 2016. Well, at the, um, at the modified accrual level, I'm, you know, for the fund level, I'm not going to be taking this revenue until I start to collect the cash because I need to see if some amount's going to go outside of 20, um, 20, uh, 60, day, uh, 60 days of 2016. So for modified accrual, okay, let's say, um, you know, we enter into 2015 for modified accrual. Okay, at the fund level, I would debit deferred inflow for 300,000, credit cash for 300,000. And let's say I just get 470. At both levels, I would debit cash 470, credit the uh, receivable 470. But for the modified accrual, right, because I would have, um, I would have just left it all in deferred inflow until I started to collect some cash. So at both levels, I would have made this entry. For a full accrual, I do this as soon as I enter into 2015. For modified accrual, I'm probably going to wait until I collect the cash. So then I get 470. And so now I'm going to go ahead and for modified accrual, I'm going to debit the deferred inflow. I'm putting that as DF. Deferred inflow for what, 470? And credit the revenue for 470. And then if I have some amount that falls out of um, this 30, the 60 days, say, you know, March 30th, I finally get some money in 2016 to finish this thing up. Then I would go ahead and debit deferred inflow 100,000 for that remaining amount. And I credit revenue, but then that for 100,000, but that's what year's revenue. That's 2016's revenue because it fell outside of the 60 days. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So let's look at this one, see how we do. Okay. Well, this is stupid because the answer is showing. <laughs> Never mind. Let's look at this one. Davis County has a December 31st year end and typically bills and collects occupational license fees for regulated business in its jurisdiction in the year before the license is valid. In October of year one, Davis County billed for year two occupational licenses in the amount of 250. The county had fully collected these fees by December 31st, year one, in his financial statements, what are we going to have? Deferred inflow, right? We would have what? Let's just look at year one. We would have debited, I don't I'm pronoun, I'm abbreviating that DF. I don't know if that exactly rhymes, but deferred inflow, I'm going to um, debit, I should say, Fees receivable. Okay, I'm just going to put receivable. And I'm going to debit that for what? Uh, 250. And then I'm going to go ahead and credit deferred inflow for 250. And then according to the fact prop, uh, pattern in year one, they collected all of it. Okay, fine. Debit cash, credit what? Receivable. And then it's not until what? Until year two that they're going to go ahead and what? Be able to debit the deferred inflow and credit the revenue, right? Okay. So year one, the revenue is zero. Question? 
Okay, I think I'm going to skip this little exercise here. And uh, let's just go straight to, for the sake of time, where's my mouse? Let's go straight to um, let me get out of this. Let's go straight to the quiz, to the midterm, practice midterm, if there's no questions. Okay, so let's just go over here. And just to make this interesting for us, I went ahead and cleaned out the highlighting. Okay, so that uh, we can work through this together. Okay, so let's take a look. And this is sort of how your actual midterm is going to look, although you'll see it in canvas when you do it um, it'll look something like this uh, with the multiple choice questions four choices etc okay maybe sometimes i have five choices sometimes there's an e but it's pretty much like this okay so under the accrual basis of accounting imposed non-exchange revenues such as fines and penalties should be recognized okay imposed non-exchange revenues such as fines should be recognized when assessed when they leave the ticket on your car? No. No. When they have an enforceable legal claim? When the government has a legally enforceable claim. Good. Now, I know that you probably felt a little funny um, when you looked and you said, well, wait a minute, John, but you said if you collect it, you take the revenue. Yeah, but it, what if you don't collect it? and the person goes past their 30 days, whatever, of due process, then you could take the revenue at that point, right? Because you have a legally enforceable claim and they haven't challenged it or anything. Okay, so no, not when collected. When the government has a legal enforceable claim and when collected within the current period or soon enough thereafter to be used to pay liabilities of the current period, well, that's what? that's telling you modified accrual rule, right? Soon enough, we've determined soon enough to finance liabilities of the current period. We've determined that to be how long in this class? 60 days. 60 days. So even though they didn't call out 60 days there, they use the more generic language, but that is the modified accrual rule, right? Question? Okay, good. Let's take a look at number three. Under modified accrual basis of accounting, license fees, permits, and other miscellaneous revenue are generally recognized for practical purposes. Okay, let's take a look. Let's start from the bottom. When related expenditures are incurred, no, that was what? That was a reimbursement type grant, right? Over the period in which the government obtains an enforceable legal claim, well, that was the case for what? For things like fines and penalties, right? Legally enforceable claim. When the exchange takes place, what exchange? Okay, this is not an exchange revenue. This is not like, hey, the government provided you a service and got some money back. They're charging you for a license, okay? And so when it's something like, and I don't know what happened to ABC here, guys. So when it's something like what? A license fee, like a driver's license, okay? Now you may say, well, John, what about when use may begin? Well, yeah, if they gave me when use may begin as a choice here, then I'd have a problem because I'd have two correct answers because things like a driver's license for practical purposes it's when cash is received, but if it was something like those occupational licenses, maybe it would be what? In the period in which the activity can be engaged in, but they didn't give me that choice. So this was more process of elimination to get to the right answer that the only, the most, the most, uh, the best answer, particularly with the phrase practical purposes up there was what? When the cash is received, which is pretty much what they do with driver's licenses. Okay. All right, good. Who wants to help me with this one? Let's see. This one looks like it might be hard. 
a city has a 1231 fiscal year and has adopted a policy of recognizing the maximum amount of property tax revenue allowable under GAAP, whatever. That always is annoying. They've adopted a policy recognizing that they will follow GAAP. I mean, GAAP tells you you got to follow GAAP. GASB says you got to follow GAAP. You don't get to say, hmm, let me get a policy to follow what the accounting rules say I'm supposed to do, okay? Property taxes of 720,000 of which 10% are estimated to be uncollectible are levied in October, 2013 to finance the activities for the fiscal year. During 2014, cash collections related to property taxes levied in October, 2013 were 600,000. In 2015, the following space related to the property taxes levied in October 13 were collected and there was 30,000 in January, 6,000 in March. For the fiscal year ended 1231, now 14, what amount should be recognized as property tax revenue related to the 2013 levy? And they tell me government wide. So what kind of accounting am I gonna use government wide? All accrual. All accrual. Oh, wait, sorry. Full accrual. Okay, good. So, what would be the journal entry for uh, levying the taxes? In Rece 2013. Receivable would be the de debit. Okay, I'm going to debit tax receivable, what, 720, I guess? Um, we do it for the full amount. Not we don't. When do we do the uncollectability part of it? Well, we debit the tax and receivable for seven twenty, right? And they tell me that ten percent are estimated to be uncollectible, right? So, what do you want to do? Ten percent, seven hundred and twenty thousand. Seventy two thousand times ten percent means seventy two thousand is uncollectible. What do you want to do with that? Uncollectible. Uh, so Create an allowance. Good. Excellent. Credit the allowance for what? 72,000. And what do you want me to credit for that remaining? Um, what is it? 648. What's 720 minus 72,000? 648? 648. Okay, what do you want me to do for this remaining 648? I'll give you a hint, it's a credit. Of course it is. Um. <laughs> hey, you know, sometimes when you're struggling for the account balance, you write down the credit and all of a sudden the correct name of the account pops into your head. Is it gonna be um, property taxes, property tax revenue? 2013? Mm, it's gonna be Unearned revenue or deferred revenue or? Well, deferred. unearned revenue is a liability. They are not synonymous. Unearned revenue is a liability, which means uh, the government is not eligible for that money yet, right? We can only use the D word, deferred inflow, for deferred inflow. Deferred inflow. Okay, wait a minute. Fine, but I want to, yeah, but I want to. I want to make sure we're clear on that. You can only use the word deferred inflow, deferred for deferred inflow. For a liability for the Caterpillar, it's you have to use the unearned revenue or revenue collected in advance, but you can't use the D word. You can't call it deferred inflow. We're okay on that now? Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay, good. So what do you want to credit here in 2013? Uh, What do you want to credit in 2013 when they send the tax bills out? Deferred inflow. Good. Now I've got deferred inflow. Good. So what happens in 2014, which is what this question was asking me about? It says for fiscal year 2014, what amount should we take as revenue? So what do you want to do in 2014? 
journal entry. We're going to debit defer to inflow for 648,000 and credit uh, some revenue account for 648,000. Yeah, revenue 648, 648,000 in 2014, because now I'm in the year for which the taxes um, may be used, right? I mean, you didn't have to go through all this, guys. I'm just showing you the full set of journal entries. Understanding that you reduce, you had to understand two things there. One, you reduce your revenue by the amount you think you're not going to collect. And two, you can't take that revenue until you enter into the year in which it began. Three, which use may begin. Three, when we collect it is of no relevance when we talk about government-wide full accrual, right? They gave us all this information to when they were collecting this money, which is irrelevant for full accrual at the government wide level. Okay. Now, how about down here? They say for my governmental fund financial statements. So, first of all, what kind of accounting do we use for our government um, governmental fund financial statements, not government wide? Modify the accrual. Now we're going to use modified accrual. Good. So when we sit here and we, um, you know, levy the taxes, we do the same thing, don't we? But what are we going to do as we collect this money? Now we're interested in when they're collecting, aren't we? So it says during 2014, 600,000 was collected. So when I'm in 2014, can I take that 600,000 under modified accrual? During 2014, yes. I collected the money. Can I take that revenue under modified accrual? Yes. Can I take that yes. revenue? Yeah. So I'm going to debit cash, 600,000. I'm going to credit the taxes receivable, 600,000. Okay. And I'm going to debit deferred inflow. 600,000 credit revenue, right? 600,000, because I'm in the year and I've collected it. Okay, how about the amount collected in January? Since it's in the 60 days, you, you it would be like an identical journal entry, except that- Now it's 30,000? Yes. Yeah. Good. Deferred inflow. 30,000 revenue, 30,000, good. Okay, now what do you wanna do with this 6,000? Now they don't tell me when in March, because maybe if it was March 1st, and they don't really tell me that they're using the 60 day criteria in this question, but let's say it's March 30th, just for our purposes that they get this money. Now what? It would be a revenue in the, um, for 2015. Yeah, very good. So I'm not going to count that, right? That would be for now 20, and when I get that money in 20, did you say 2015? When I get that money in 2015, March, I will debit cash, credit the tax receivable, debit the deferred inflow, 6,000, credit what? Credit the uh, revenue, 6,000. But that's revenue for what year? That's 2015 revenue, isn't it? Because it fell, we're presuming, outside. And sometimes the students will say, well, how, would I, how am I supposed to know about that? Well, you're supposed to know because there is no 636. So you'd have to kind of use some test taking strategy here to know that the answer is 630, right? There is no 636. Sometimes students say, well, what about the rest of that money? They still haven't collected. And my answer is, I don't know. And I don't care when they collected it. All I know is it ain't revenue of 2014 <laughs> for this problem. Okay. Question. Okay, good. Let's try this one. Oh, um I, I was about to ask, Professor. Yeah. So ahead. on the 
So on the left side of the uh, of this, right, it is the uh, uh, is this the government wide statement or is this the uh, government fund? All of this whole problem, everything I wrote under this problem is um, is governmental fund, except the debit to cash and credit to tax receivable is the same for both of them. Okay, got. It. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no difference because cash is cash and receivables are receivables, right? And so, and we follow the same rule that you set up the allowance for the amount that you're not going to take. So the, that you're not going to collect. So the only accounts that are affected here are revenue and deferred inflow in terms of the difference between modified accrual and accrual. Okay. Okay, good. This one, they give me a set of information and they want me to determine what amount should be recognized in the governmental fund financial statement. So what type of accounting am I using? Modified. Good. Okay. And I, I'm not a huge fan at looking at the call to question and then saying, but you start seeing something like this and you know that your revenue recognition question, you know, you're going to get that, then it's probably worthwhile to just go ahead and see, okay, what fund am I doing the accounting for government wide governmental fund? I'm using what modified accrual, right? Government wide, I'm using full accrual. So they tell me here that a city has a 1231 fiscal year and adopted the policy of recognizing revenue tax revenue consistent with the 60 day rule allowed period under gap. Again, alcoholics writing these questions. Gap doesn't come down and say 60 days, you bastards. I mean, you know, have a little pride in what you're putting down here in these books and don't let, you know, a bunch of students sit there and flop anything they want into these and then you don't bother to review them or anything. Okay. Where are these uh, questions from? This is from the textbook. McGraw or Becker? This one is Wiley. Oh, okay, gotcha. This is written by a member. This book is written by a member of Gasby himself. Oh, wow. Um, and then when I call out these things to him, mistakes that were in the, made in the book, his answer to me was, well, I didn't write that question. Well, it's your freaking book. So they let somebody else write the questions and then there's no quality control. And that's when people like me start losing more hair. Because I don't like, I like things to be proper. Okay, so it's not a 60 day rule allowed. And you could say, well, why don't you just delete that, John? Because I like to be annoyed and tell you about it. Um, so 60 day rule, my point here, guys, in all seriousness is it's not a 60 day rule. It's what it's a guideline that can be used, but there's no rule. Okay. Anyway, property taxes of 600,000 of which none are estimated to be uncollectible or levied in October, 2013 to finance the activities of fiscal 2014 property taxes are due in two installments, cash collections related to property taxes are as follows, okay? So what I wanna do is just write the year next to these, okay? So property tax levied in 2012, due in 2013, received in 2014, okay? So is that 12 money, 13 money, or 14 money? 12. 12. Try again. Well, actually it's 13. 13, it? sorry, 13. That's 13, good, okay. Good, it's not 12 because it was levied in 12. Well, I could see why you might say, because it doesn't really say that it was for 2013 activity, but if it's due in 2013, then it was probably for 2013 activity. You can make that assumption, okay? So how about for property tax levied in 2012, due in 2013, and they get it in February 14, we're still what? And 13. We're money. still looking at 13 money. Okay, good. And then um, for property tax 11 in 2012, due in 13, but 
but they got it on March 15th. That's 13? 14. They got it outside the 60 days, so that becomes what? That becomes 14 money, doesn't it? We're outside the 60 days? Correct. Yes, okay. Oh, yeah, I see. All right. Okay, okay good. No, that's right. For Look, if you get half the problems wrong here, you're half the way there. All you got to do is clean that up as you go forward for your exam. Uh, so don't worry. Okay, I'd rather you get it wrong here than you know get the miss it up on the exam. Okay, uh, 6 2014, first installment of taxi, taxes levied in 2013 due 2014. That's 14 money, isn't it? Yes. How about second installment? Do 12, 20, 14, and they got it in 14. 14. That's 14 money, good. How about for property taxes, 11 and 13, due in 14, and they got it in January 15th of 15? 14. Still 14 money. How about what? 10,000 due in 14. They got it in February 15. We still got what? 14. 14 money. And then what? This last one, like before, slips outside of the 60 days of 14. So that's going to be what? 15. 15 money. Okay, good. And so what? You add all that up. What do you get here? 535? Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. Now, guys, if you're writing copiously, trying to take all this down, um, the marked up version is showing you all this, right? I just took all I just took all this nonsense out of there so we could engage our brains a little bit as we go through it. It's more of a workout now, right? Okay. Same fact pattern, now they want what? Government wide, okay? So do I care when they collected amounts? Nope. As long as that money was tagged for 14, it's 14 money, isn't it? Yep. Okay, so I've got what? I've got the 350, I've got what? The 150, I've got the what? 15,000, I wasn't trying to strike that out. This is probably better, right? I don't know what's better. How about, yep, 14, 14, right? So I wasn't trying to highlight the 10. Of course, when I go to highlight, it'll probably take the whole thing off. <laughs> here, 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 here. What does that add up to? Six hundred thousand. Guys, uh, I don't think it does. Yeah. Um, but isn't this just because they in the in the fact pattern up here it says property taxes of six hundred thousand, which of none are estimated to be uncollectible? Wouldn't that just be the automatic? Oh yeah, yeah. You're right. My bad. So that was confusing. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, you wouldn't have to, you know, I'm not trying to strike these out, but you wouldn't do this. You're very, you're absolutely right. Property taxes of what? 600,000, my bad. I started getting into more of the detail there and I didn't need to, right? What's that supposed to mean? What's that whistle? Oh, um, I didn't. I didn't expect that uh, the property tax of six hundred thousand was actually um, like that. So I was. I thought we had to calculate everything, but uh, I whistle because it's a trap. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Um, taxes receivable. Did they tell us the whole amount? 
I don't even know what the whole amount was here. Oh, it's all 600,000 then to be uncollectible. So debit tax receivable, 600,000, that's in 2013. I'm doing government wide now. Credit <clears throat> deferred inflow. Six hundred thousand, and then what? And then twenty fourteen. As soon as we get into twenty fourteen, debit deferred inflow. Six hundred thousand, right? And credit the revenue. Six hundred thousand. I don't care when they collect it. I don't care if they don't get around to collecting this until twenty eighteen. It's still what? It's still twenty fourteen revenue, isn't it? Right here. Under full accrual. So I fell into the trap here of the question of trying to look at this collection list to figure it out. Okay, question. I, I guess like how, how do we like compare number seven and number six, right? I guess it's so easy just to make that mistake of, you know, um, calculating the whole thing and then understanding like the property tax uh, revenue was actually just 600,000. Um, so I guess um, my question is that how, how do we be, have to be really careful with kind of question like this uh, kind of silly question, but. Well, two things, one, knowing the difference between the rules for government-wide and governmental fund, modified accrual versus accrual, right? Modified accrual has the 60 days as the difference, right? So we had to watch it to see when we collected it, right? Okay. Whereas for modified accrual, and I just got locked into looking down at this list here rather than just reading and seeing that it was 600,000, then that's the amount of revenue that you take in 2014 because it was 2014 money, right? Okay. All right. Professor, Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, I have a question. Why are there a difference between the sum of these details and the uh, 600,000 that's in the sentence? Some of what details? Uh, so if we sum up all the collections, it's not going to be 600,000. And I was wondering why. Because some of that money is 2013 money. This one was that they levied property taxes 600,000 for 2014 activity, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, some of this money was for 2013 activity, for bills they made out, mailed out in 2012, right? Mm -hmm. And when we collect it is not relevant for full accrual accounting. Okay, so if there is no like sentence that says property taxes of 600,000, I'll leave it in October, 2013. If there's no sentence like this, do we just add up all the collections in 2014, uh, I mean, all the taxes levied in 2014? Yeah, I don't see how else you would answer it without that. But once you have that, then 600,000 has to be the correct answer because they could be collecting some amounts in April of, and this is also screwed up because this should be 2015 down here. Um, there could be some amounts that they would collect in April of 2015, May of 2015, June of 2015, and for the government wide under full accrual, it's still all 2014 money. It doesn't matter when they collect it. So once you got this, that trumped all this down here. Okay. For, accrual, for government wide for Fun level for modified accrual, yeah, you had to look to see when they collected it and what year was it earmarked for. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, sure. Okay.
see if I can get this centered on the screen where I want it. Okay, let's look at this one now. And governmental fund, what kind of um, accounting am I going to use? Modified accrual. Good, got to use modified accrual. And so let's go ahead and see what they tell us about these amounts and decide whether we want to take them or not. You guys tell me. Okay, so let's look at this first one. We'll stick with the red here. Amount received 1 2014 applicable to 2013. Sales. These are sales taxes. Sale took place in 13. They received the money in 14. It would be for 13. You wouldn't get to take it in 14. Good. That's 13 money. Good. How about amount received to 2014 applicable to 14 sales? 2014. Good. Applicable to 2014. It's 14 sales. They collected it within 60 days. They collected it in 2014. Amount received during 2014 related to 2014 sales. Yeah. 2014. 14. How about amount received 12, 2015 related to 2014 sales? 14. 14 money. How about amounts received January 2015 related to 15 sales? 15. Good. That's 15 money. So you add up those 14s now and you get what? Um, 555 five what? 540. 540? Okay, good. Okay, let's take a look at this next one. Same fact pattern. Now they're asking me what? Now they're asking me. Government wide, uh, government wide financial statement. Yeah. Okay, good. So let's see. You see how they're driving drunk here, guys? Isn't this sales? So why are they asking me property taxes here? Okay, anyway, it's sales tax. Um, so 2013, we already knew, let's just look up here. We already knew that that was what the underlying sale took place in 13. So that's, let's just do it again. That's 13 money, right? Is this 14 money here? Yes. Yeah. took place 14. 14. Sales took place what? 14, 14, 14, 14, 14. So 15, I mean, we looked at the list a little differently and that we didn't bother as to when it was collected. We just looked to see when the sales were, but since everything was collected within what, 60 days of 14, then you got the same answer, both under modified accrual and full accrual, and that can't happen. Okay, good. Number 10. Um, you guys all right or you want a break? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Can, can do it. Okay. During 2014, the city issued 300 fines for failure to keep real property in an acceptable condition. During the period, the city spent 200 to mow and clean up the unoccupied properties for which the fines were assessed. The city estimates that 30 of the fines issued in 2014 will be uncollectible. Okay. And we're heading towards government fund financial statements. During 2014, the city collected to 30 related to 2014 fines and 20 related to 2013 fines. What revenue should we take for these fines? Now, these are fines. When does the government recognize a fine? criteria that's got a legal right has a legally enforceable claim is that correct that is the correct term yeah okay so when you look at this do you see anything here that indicates that this government has a legally enforceable claim mm, they performed a service that's their problem okay then in that case no Really? Well, do if they issue pay? it, don't they have the claim to it? Do you, huh? If they issue the $300 in fines, isn't that their claim to it? I was on an assignment 
looking at U.S. Forest Service. And what the Forest Service was doing, so what happens is, let's say you're a farmer and you want to clear a field. What farmers will do a lot of times, they'll do what they call a controlled burn, and they burn away whatever shrubbery or whatever that they don't want. And every now and then those fires get a little bit crazy and they burn good forest land. Is the forest service happy when that happens? No. Why do they get so mad? Because they have to use the money to do it. Well, yeah, they had to put the fire out. Yeah, that's true. But they're also mad because now they can't sell that timber. No. Oh. <laughs> They have lumber there that they will control how it's cut. You know, they don't tell somebody, they don't tell Paul Bunny, hey, go to town, dude, you know, have fun. They decide there's a part of the forest that's ready for harvest and they go in and they sell that parcel of land. And it's literally, I attended a competitive bid where they literally open up the bids and the highest bid gets that parcel. And you've got these guys, you know, standing there all waiting to see what's going to happen. And then the guy who, the lumberjack who wins the bid is a very happy guy because now he's going to get that parcel of land and make some money and everybody else walks out all upset because they, they didn't get the bid. So the government makes money on the sale of those forest lands. Now, what happens? Um, so you are a farmer near there. You do a controlled burn and you accidentally burn some of that land. What's the Forest Service going to do to you? Find you. Bill. They're going to find you probably, and they're going to send you a bill saying you owe us for that land. Now, what Forest Service was doing is they were booking a receivable and a revenue for that. Meanwhile, what's going on? They hadn't proven that that particular farmer that they billed had started the fire, and the farmers were still fighting that. So we told them, uh, 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 you have not met the revenue recognition criteria because they still have due process left. And they're claiming that they didn't start the fire. They don't owe you that money. So you don't have, you don't even have an asset. You don't have a receivable and you don't have a revenue that you can take because you don't have a legally enforceable claim. So take those off the books and forest service. They were good about it. They didn't get mad at us. Uh, they were, they were understood where we were coming from and they made an adjustment for that. Okay. Now, in this case, do you see any evidence that indicates that this government has a legally enforceable claim? No. Well, I guess since they they collected two hundred thirty dollars in twenty fourteen, so I guess that's the actual amount that's they're legally entitled to. They collected the two thirty. Good. And how about this 220 that they collected in, I mean, this 20 that they collected in 2014 related to 2013 fines? When did they have a legally enforceable claim to that $20? 2014. Huh? 2014. 2014, when they collected it, right? Yes. That's the only thing I see that indicates to me that they have legal enforceable claim is the fact that these fools, these people gave up and paid. Do you pay a fine if you don't have, if you don't feel you owe it? No, you'll sit there, you know, now look, if they say, hey, you know, if we proved you wrong, you're going to get the death penalty, then you might say, okay, well, here, you know, but for the most part, you just go ahead and you let your due process go through, don't you? Yep. Okay. Okay, good. Number 11. Before we move on. Yeah. Does it matter which month they collected the $20 related to 2013 funds? Um, well, they tell us during 2014, and it does not matter here because, um, again, the criteria that we're looking for is the government takes when they have a legally enforceable claim. Okay, because it's not exchange, there's no time component? This is the time component. The time component is that they have the legally enforceable claim. We're, not, we're still not even dealing with eligibility here. 
the, the, the time requirement is when the government has a legally enforceable claim. And so if it said the government had a legally enforceable claim to these um, 200 in uh, these $20 related to 2013 fines and they had a legally enforceable claim in 2013, then it would matter when in 2014 they collected it and we'd start applying the 60 days. But they didn't tell us that. The only evidence that we have that they have a legally enforceable claim is the payment, right? Correct. Okay. So that legally enforceable claim is a time component, not an eligibility component. Correct. Okay. Thank you. you no, know, it's it's a subtle and nerdy thing. Okay. So the best way to sort of, you know, kind of strengthen up your understanding of that so that it's clear in your head at all times is the only time that eligibility becomes relevant is in the case of what government mandated or voluntary on exchange remember that table right the only time eligibility got included as a requirement was for those two and for it's not even very interesting for government mandated because government mandated only comes into play when it is what when it is a reimbursement grant. In other words, you have to spend the money to be eligible. So that's easy. Just look to see if they spent the money or not for eligibility. And the only time it becomes interesting is in the voluntary non-exchange because now the government has to tell you, congratulations. The higher level of government has to say, congratulations, we're giving you this money because we like your project, right? Now you're eligible. And if they tell you, well, you can't start, here's the money, but you can't start using it till next year, you have met eligibility, but not time. You are what? Deferred inflow. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we use deferred inflow for our, um, our imposed and our uh, derived non-exchange because we may start to get to an asset resource inflow before the period that we're actually able to use the money in, case, in the case of the, um, particularly that's the case in the case of the, um, even at the government wide level, in the case of the property taxes, in the case of sales taxes derived, really deferred inflow doesn't start coming into play so much until we're in a situation where we're doing what? we're collecting money outside of the 60 days, then at the fund level, a deferred inflow starts to come relevant. Okay. So let's look at this one. I think this will help with the uh, eligibility consideration a little bit more. So a city receives notice of $150,000 grant from the state to purchase vans to support physically challenged individuals. Although the city did not receive any of the grant funds during the current year, they went ahead and they purchased a bus. And sometimes students say, well, if it's a bus, then they didn't follow the requirements because it's supposed to be a van. No, they purchased a bus for 65 and they purchased a van for 60,000. How much revenue should we recognize on the government wide statements in the current year? So a city receives notice of 150,000 grant Okay, so they got that notice that they received the grant. So what should they do? Well, since it's the government wide financial statements, it's full accrual. So why don't you just book that whole thing as revenue? Good, debit grant receivable, right? They haven't gotten any of the money yet, but they told them they received notice that they got the grant. Congratulations, right? It's revenue. Didn't say that they can't spend the money this year. Nothing, right? In fact, they don't even have the money yet, but so what? They have what? They have met the eligibility in time, right? So what's the answer here, D? Okay, now this one tells me, the next one tells me that last year, and then it's the same fact pattern. And they say, what should be recognized in the government wide statements in the current year? Yeah, well, same fact 
Huh? Zero. Good. Zero because what? It was last year's money when I met the eligibility. There was nothing here that said I couldn't spend the money in the current year. And so um, there's no deferred inflow. It just goes straight to revenue in the year that I received the grant. When I spend the money is of no consequence. Okay, how about this one? Paul City received payment of two grants from the state during its fiscal year ending September 30th, 2013. Grant A can be used to cover any operating expenses during 2014. Grant B can be used at any time to acquire equipment for the city's fire department. Should the city report these grants as grant revenue or deferred inflow for 2013? Okay, so they're telling me that what? They tell me that uh, Grant A can be used any time for expenses incurred when? 2014. So is Grant A revenue or deferred inflow? Deferred inflow. Deferred inflow. Good. Very good. Okay, so I know A, I'm just going to put over here, is deferred inflow. Okay. Then they sit here and they tell me that the grant B money can be used anytime. What do you want to do with B money? Via revenue because time and eligibility are met. Good. It's revenue because well, I got the grant already and there was no time requirement on it. So I don't have to worry about time. So I've got what choice B here. Okay. Okay, good question. Number 14, reimbursement type grant revenues are recognized in the counting period in which reimbursement grant. When have I met eligibility? Expenditure. Expenditure are recorded on grant revenue. Good. Number 15, unrestricted grant revenues with a time requirement should be recognized as what? Receivable. All right, when the cash is received. C. So in the period the grant is required to be used. In the period in which the grant is required to be used, when the award is announced, um, it has a time requirement, so I have to make sure I'm in the period when I can use that, right? When cash is received is of no consequence at all. I mean, I could debit cash and credit deferred inflow if I can't start using that money until that next year, right? Just like when people sent in money ahead of time, right? They give me the grant, a debit grant. They send me the cash. I debit cash. I credit deferred inflow if it's 20, well, I don't know why I'm going back to these old years. If it's 2020, and then when use may begin, I do what? I debit the deferred inflow and I credit the cash at that time. I mean, not credit the cash, I credit the revenue at that time because now I'm in 2021 and I can start to use that money, right? So when the cash comes in, it doesn't matter. If I'm not in the year yet when I can use it, I'm not recognizing that as revenue, okay? Uh, D, when expenditures are recognized, no, that's irrelevant. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this one. And I didn't bother to erase that. Uh, journal entry. So let's just take a look at this. Um, number 16, the general fund levies property taxes in the amount of a million dollars for calendar year 2014. It expects to collect 950 during the year, 30,000 in the first 60 days of the next year, and 15,000 during the rest of the next year. It does not expect to collect the remaining 5,000. And they just wanted to know the revenue here. And you can see the answer is 980, but I think it's useful 
to uh, look at the journal entry, debit the tax receivable, credit the revenue for 980, deferred inflow is that amount that what will fall outside of the 60 days. So we picked up the 950 plus the 30 amounts outside the 60 days are going to be what? They are going to be deferred inflow and then we credit the allowance for the uncollectible amount. How did I know to use the 60 day criteria? General fund. Governmental fund modified accrual. Number 17, a city levies property taxes of 1,050,000, but believes that it will not be able to collect 50,000. What entry should it make when the taxes are levied? And, uh, you know, you look at this and there is no deferred inflow option. So you're sitting there and saying, okay, I you know, can't get into the time requirements because they're not even allowing me to consider deferred inflow. So I'm just needed to know here that I reduce the revenue by the amount I think I'm not gonna collect, right? Question? Well, can, can I, can I kind of reason that because I know that the tax, the property tax receivable is going to be a, a million uh, fifty thousand, and then I don't see any of this written down here, so I just choose A. Is that okay as well? Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, I guess. would, I would say that this is the correct answer because this is the correct answer. No, okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, you are asking me about a journal entry. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. yeah. Now that I look at this question, it's a little funky because when you look at it, you know, if you put B and C together, it equals A. So, and no law says that you have to sit here. Oh, no. No, no, no. Because we'd be missing. Um, yeah. If you put. Oh, no, no. You don't debit. No, because we wouldn't have enough in the receivable. So, actually, you ask a good question. You know, could B and C are wrong because we don't end up with enough in the receivable, right? If you do it this way, and it presented yeah. that you did this something else up here. So yeah, A is stands out pretty clearly as the right answer. I don't know about these these other ones. I mean, you get to a point in life, guys, where you know I've looked at this enough that B, C, D, and E look like you know creatures from outer space to me. So it's a little hard for me to consider them as earthbound. <laughs> you know, and A is the right answer. Okay. All right, good. Number 18, which of the following is not a derived? How about sales tax? How about sales tax? Yeah, because that's uh, an exchange tax, right? Well, no. Sales tax is not exchange. The only thing that's exchanged is when I pay the government and the government does a service for me, lets me cross a bridge, gives me a bus ride, brings me water. That's exchange. Non-exchange is you pay your taxes and you expect the government to be there. So when you buy something at the store, you don't call up the, you know, the state and say, by the way, I just paid, you know, 10% sales tax. So why don't you come mow my lawn? No, you know that those sales tax are going to go for whatever, right? Uh, for example, uh, the, for years, Alameda County had a half percent more sales tax than other parts of the Bay Area because we were being taxed for BART 
um, before the other counties decided to put BART in. That's why you don't have BART as extensively in um, Alameda and Santa Clara County because they had voted not to have BART extended down there at that time, which was a fundamental failure of leadership of government at that time. Think about it. This Real is big NIMBY problem. Huh? Real big NIMBY problem. What's a NIMBY? Not in my backyard. Someone who... Um, who sticks their feet in the, they're a stick in the mud about development? Yeah, it was kind of, there was, there was, yeah. I mean, there was some of that because they didn't want to connect some areas of the Bay Area that they considered more desirable to parts of the Bay Area that they considered not as desirable, right? I mean, if you connect up, you know, Hayward, where I live, to, um, you know, uh, San Mateo County, well, maybe you've invited some people from Hayward that you don't want. And all they got to do is jump on a bar train and pay, you know, a dollar to get there. So they they basically made a very bad mistake because we're talking in the 60s and the cost to extend BART, they should have circumferenced the bay with BART in the 60s. Instead, they put it in some places, charged a half a cent more sales tax. We got BART and then other parts where they didn't pay the sales tax, it took them a lot longer to get it. Now, what's irritating is more trains go to some of those counties that paid later than the counties that paid earlier, which is a little annoying, but I guess they based that on population. Anyway, that's the kind of thing that sales tax might go for, but even though the sale is an exchange, you, you, know, you pay your sales tax, you get this thing. I get why you might think that, sales tax in and of itself is a non-exchange revenue is it derived non-exchange i scrolled back in the lecture slides and i now know that it is derived yeah it is it's a derived non-exchange how about um so this says what is not how about property tax that's an imposed non-exchange right good so b is the right answer here yes Okay, good. Number 19, Chase City imposes a 2% tax on hotel charges. What do you think? Voluntary non-exchange, imposed non-exchange, government mandated non-exchange or derived? Is it gonna be B? Well, I know it's tricky because they said imposes, but derived. derived derives its value from the underlying transaction, which is the what? Staying at the hotel. Huh? Right? Derived is derived by the underlying transaction. The underlying transaction here is staying at a hotel. So that's considered something like sales tax too, right, Professor? Yeah. yeah. The oh, cool. sales tax is derived because what? Because the underlying transaction is the sale, isn't it? Income taxes, C on 18, is derived because the underlying transaction is you earning money, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Property tax, they just tell you, send me this much. How much is your house worth? Million dollars? Good. Give me 1%. What happens if you don't give it to them? They take away your house. <laughs> well, they'll go through a process, but it could lead to that eventually. But they'll definitely put a lien. Go ahead. Try to sell a house that's got a tax lien on it. Try it sometime. Try to buy a house that's got a tax lien on it. Governments can get that money. I know that this is wrong because I scrolled up. But why is property tax not a derived tax? It's derived from the city's assessment of your, the value of your property, right? There's no underlying transaction. So derived has to come from a transaction? Yes. Okay, thank you. There has to be an underlying transaction. Property tax. There's no uh, transaction if you're just holding a house. Yeah, well, that's not a transaction. Holding a house is not a transaction. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Um, you know, 
um, when you start to get to my age, you start thinking about, okay, I'm going to pay off this property so I don't have to pay so much a month anymore. And then all of a sudden, an evil monster pops out of the ground and says, yeah, but what about the property taxes? You still got to pay the property taxes. And sometimes those property tax could be significant if the house, you know, and in the Bay Area, if the house is worth a couple million dollars, that can start to build up at, even at one and a half percent. That can start to be, you know, that's not nothing a month that you have to pay. So property taxes keep going no matter what. You're going to pay those property taxes till you die. And when you die, somebody else will pay that property tax on that property. <laughs> okay, good. Number 20. Um, let's look at this one. The following information pertains to property taxes, taxes levied by Oak City for calendar year 2014, blah, blah, blah. What should Oak report in its fund financial statements? What type of accounting are we using? Modified accrual. Modified accrual, okay. And it relates to 2014. So if it's collected in 2014, should we use it? Yes. Okay. First 60 days? Yes. Or 15? The rest expected during the balance of 2015? No. Estimated to be uncollectible? No. Total levy is irrelevant. So the answer here is 600,000? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Good work, guys. Questions on any of this? Okay, so it's a little bit hard at first. I understand that. But I think you're kind of seeing the formula here, which is the different categories, government-wide versus fund. Okay, so that one chart, that one slide that I kept making a big deal out of, I would sleep with that under your pillow. I would have that with you during when you're taking the exam, it's a good little cheat sheet to help you remember how that stuff works. And then you more you practice with it, okay? You're pretty good at it now. I think you keep practicing with that. You're gonna be champs and be able to answer these kind of questions. This is about as hard as it gets in this class, by the way. Okay. Question? Oh, I was about to ask for practice just uh, practice these exam quiz that you gave us um, is there any any other you know like process like journal entry that we can practice from professor like journal entries that you can practice from um well you've got the textbook materials yes. for chapter nine would be relevant here so I'll go through that and see which ones are dealing with revenue recognition. You can okay. go through and look at that. You'll see that in the book. I forget. Let me see. Let me see if I can remember what module it's in. Um, Thank you. So what I would say right now Right now, hopeful reading for you, I'd say, would be up through um, chapter nine, module four. Mo module four, okay. Up to module four, yeah. Right. I would say right now, okay. And then okay. Um, when you register for the um, access to the software, right. um, I would say that, um, you know, the modules match what I just told you. So you should okay. have a whole raft of questions. Now I'm saying that, although we're not done with 4B yet, but once we're done with 4B, that kind of matches nicely up to module four of chapter nine and the associated homework. All right, understood. Thank you, professor. Yeah.
Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a 10 minute break, guys. Okay, we'll come back at 10 to four. And let's see if we can't put at least a dent in the second part of, ch of uh, chapter four. Okay. All right. All right, guys. See you in a few minutes. I'm going to hit pause. Somebody remind me to hit record again when we get back. Zoom recording. Okay, there we go. And um, let's go ahead and jump into now um, chapter four, part B, part two, whatever. Um, what I've done, uh, before we get started, guys, any questions? Sorry. Okay, and uh, one second, I just wanna get that sun out of my face because it's gonna start to bug me. Okay, good. That's a little better. Okay. Um, so now what we're going to do with um, chapter 4B, part two of chapter four, is now start to turn our attention to uh, the actual spending of the money. So we've talked about the revenue recognition, the collection of the cash and whatnot. Now the government is going to uh, spend those uh, revenues that we looked at um, the recognition criteria in the first part, part A of chapter four. So, meh. Okay, one second, guys. So annoying. Let me get out of this. Okay, there we go. Okay, so you start getting into uh, some of these transactions, and what we're going to have to understand here is our budgetary accounting. Okay, so Unlike most entities where they set a budget, government accounting is different in that now we're going to literally be saying that we're going to have formalized, standardized budget entries. All entities have a budget, but it's unique to government that there are standardized requirements and journal entries that you make when you set your budget. Okay, so what we have here are a series of budgetary accounts. Okay, and you need to know the names of these accounts and you need to be very familiar with them. And then you need to know how to record journal entries into these accounts. So this is the part of governmental accounting that gets a little bit difficult sometimes for folks at first. And then once you get used to it, it's not that bad. Okay, so notice we first have our estimated revenues and our estimated other financing sources. So we've talked about revenue recognition, but an entity would need to estimate how much revenue it thinks it's going to um, collect in any given year and budget around that, okay? Then we have estimated other financing sources. And remember, we said that other financing sources were like non-operating expenses, but we reported them where? We reported them in that lower section of the statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balance. Okay, so we have our estimated revenues, our estimated other financing sources. You look, and the second group down here is our appropriations and our estimated other financing uses. Now, remember, other financing uses from chapter two were like non operating expenses, but we don't call them that. Right, so our transfers out were our other financing uses, but um, when we're budgeting, we have to estimate what we think those amounts are going to be for the period. Appropriations are like L I K E, like estimated expenditure. Okay, that says like estimated expenditure, but we don't call it an estimated expenditure. We call it appropriation. And we call it appropriation because it is very special in government that there has to be legal authority to spend money before you can actually spend that money. 
And so that's why, although we're not studying federal government accounting in here, but that's why you see President Biden going back and forth with the Republicans and whatnot, because they can't spend the money until a law is passed that say they can spend that money. That law is called an appropriation law. So once we have an appropriation law, we know how much money we can spend. So notice we did what? We put our revenues together and our other financing sources together. Those are the resource inflows. We put our other financing uses and our expenditures together, but we call them appropriations. We put those together. That's our asset outflows, right? Okay. And then we have this account, which is budgetary control. Okay. That's sort of a catch-all account for a lot of these entries. And then we're going to be dealing with encumbrance accounts and uh, budgetary control. So our encumbrance account, man, I don't understand why um, it seems to me Microsoft could do a better job with PowerPoint than they do. I don't know why now I don't have my pen going up. Something, it can't be this hard. I can't tell you why my pen palette disappeared here. There's no rhyme or reason for it. Anybody's got any thoughts, let me know. But I cannot tell you why I lost my pens down here. And it comes and goes. It does it. Then it doesn't do it. I can't tell you why. Okay. So we have our what? We have our encumbrances and our budgetary control. And we're going to see that anytime we order goods or services, we're going to have to use this encumbrance account, not services, some services we don't have to, but anytime we order goods, we'll use this encumbrance account, okay? So let's just go ahead and take a look at some of these journal entries here. And um, at the beginning of the year, okay, this is at the beginning of the year, bag of year is beginning of the year, okay? This government will make this high level, general ledger level journal entry here to debit estimated revenue and credit appropriations. Appro appropriations is like our estimated expenditure. Now this government has what? Has $50,000 that it thinks it's gonna have left over. That 50,000 is called a surplus. Now, can you think of a government that budgets to spend more than it's going to take in? Almost all of them. <laughs> no, no. Some governments, many state and local governments, many local governments have a surplus. Some states are required to have a surplus, but there's, or at least balance the budget, but there's one government that always has a deficit, always plans to federal. Spend federal government always has it well i say always i mean there was like a half a year there the last year of clinton's administration there was a surplus but for the most part what there's almost always a deficit right for the federal government for state and local governments often there will be a small surplus or they'll just balance the budget there'll be no surplus at all if we have a surplus though, there'll be no deficit, there'll be no surplus. If we have a surplus, we will credit budgetary control. If we have a deficit, then we will do what? We'll debit budgetary control. So if this government had estimated revenue of say 480, they would debit estimated revenue 480, say the appropriation, was 500,000, right? And then we would have to, what, do we need a debit or a credit to make this journal entry balance? That's the easiest question I'm gonna ask you all day. We would debit, what, bud control for this um, 
well, it's 20,000 in this case, we would debit the budgetary control for 20,000. That would be an example of a deficit, right? Because this government is planning to spend more than it takes in. So deficit spending is not an accident. Sometimes I think people think, oh, geez, you know, something went wrong and now they have deficit spending. It is a planned legal authority. That's why it gets ridiculous when the federal government starts coming up against the debt ceiling, which in the last few years under Trump, they stopped doing this because this is a, re a game that a Republican legislature plays on a Democrat president. But for some reason, that rule doesn't go the other way. That game doesn't go the other way. Um, so it didn't happen a lot under Trump, but you'll probably start to hear it at some point under Biden they have a debt ceiling. And what the debt ceiling says is they can't go past a certain number for the debt, okay? And the debt is an accumulation of deficits year after year after year. But the silly game that they play is they sit there and they pass a law that creates a deficit in any one year that they know is going to take them over the debt ceiling. And then when they start to get up to the debt ceiling, they know they were going to go over it because they just passed a law that required that they go over it. As they start to get up to the debt ceiling, then they start having this argument about how they can't raise the debt ceiling. And it becomes this whole ridiculous thing. Wait a minute. You voted to pass a budget that required that you would go over the debt ceiling. And then when it's time to go over the debt ceiling, you say you don't want to go over the debt ceiling. And so um, they play a little bit of a political game with it. So we'll see what happens. I don't know what the debt ceiling is now or when they anticipate going over it. But if you have, um, if you have a, a Democratic president and a Republican Senate, that almost always comes up. For some reason, it doesn't go the other way. So anyway we could have a deficit or we could have a surplus this example i mean don't they just sorry to interrupt don't they just like raise the debt ceiling anyway it doesn't congress just raise it well they they do after some nonsense because um i guess it was uh, it was probably about 2010 2011 they were going around saying we're not going to raise the debt ceiling and, you know, people who later on became QAnon <laughs> were just saying, well, all you have to do is just default, just default on the debt. The federal government would just default on the debt. Don't raise the debt ceiling, just default on the debt. And, you know, it's like invasion of the body snatchers. You'd have somebody that at one moment you respected and at the next moment they turned into somebody that said the federal government could just default on its debt and nothing bad would happen. Was, who are you? What happened to you? Okay, and so um, there was some talk of that. Now, eventually they go ahead and raise it, but after they put you know someone through political hell. So it was during the Obama administration that the man had to sit there and drag himself through the mud, begging the Congress to do something that they should basically automatically do because the federal government can't be felt, default on its debt. When Trump got in, somehow that all went away and they raised the debt ceiling a few times under him. I don't know how high they raised it. I haven't heard any talk of it lately. Um, hopefully, maybe they raised it high enough that we can avoid that nonsense for a while. So who was asking me about the rating of the Moody's rating of the Treasury Securities? That came at that time as a result of the fact that the political climate was such that it wasn't sure if the government would raise the debt ceiling or not. And that was the reason that Moody's downgraded the federal government's uh, debt. The thing that was stupid is it had absolutely no impact. <laughs> you know, they got in, they downgraded. I don't know if it was Moody's or S&P, maybe it was S&P, but it had absolutely no impact. So you still borrow money at a very low interest rate if you're the federal government anyway. Does that answer the question? They play political football with it, is I think what I'm saying. Gotcha. Yeah. A lot okay. of political football, it sounds like. Yeah, it, it, it basically what it was. But it's, it's dangerous political football because 
it could result maybe someday in somebody saying, hey, well, I don't want to buy government debt because there is a chance that the political climate has gotten so weird. I mean, think about it. You're storming the Capitol. You're running you know, into cars, into guards at the Capitol. You've got all this stuff going on coming off of a pandemic and you start playing around with that debt ceiling thing again. I don't know, you know, at some point there's almost gonna be so much that the whole system can bear, right? So anyway, okay, but right now I don't even know what the debt ceiling is. I may be railing on something that's years off in advance of it being a problem again. So we don't need to load our sharpens yet. Not yet. Um, <laughs> if the government defaults on its debt, that's a whole new world on that side of the happening. Okay. Okay, good. Now down here, we're showing you the subsidiary ledgers down here, guys. Don't worry about that. I only want the GL level. All that's doing is telling you the details as to where the revenue is going to come from the details as to how they're gonna spend this 450,000. We don't worry about the details of subsidiary level. I just need you to know this GL level entry that's made at the beginning of the year, debit estimated revenue, credit appropriation. If you have a surplus, credit budgetary control. If you have a deficit, debit budgetary control. I guess I wrote that again and it was already right there. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and let's understand now why we debit a revenue account. Now it makes you feel funny that you're debiting a revenue account, but it's a budgetary account. It's not a real account. It's a budgetary account. Okay. So what do we do? We debit our what? Our estimated revenue. Okay. And now in our revenues ledger, we have what? We have $500,000 debit balance. Then what happens? Then we collect some revenue, whatever, right? So we debit cash, we credit revenue. We're assuming we've met our revenue recognition rule here. I'm not testing on revenue recognition here, but if we've met the revenue recognition, we credit, and I put quotes on actual revenue. We really, the correct title is really just revenue and that's a credit, we enter that credit in here, we now know that we have 460,000 to go. We go a little bit later, we get some more revenue, we debit cash, we credit revenue, we stick that credit there, we now know we have what? 410,000 to go and so on. So by debiting estimated revenue at the beginning of the year there like that, we set up that debit that stands as a placeholder against the corresponding credits which are actual revenue when they come in. Question? Okay, good. Now, let's go ahead and order some goods. And in this case, they go ahead and they order some kind of uh, printer. Well, that's a hell of a printer. Okay, it's gonna cost them 50,000. Okay, so they order this printer for 50,000. Must be a really nice printer. So what are they gonna do? Anytime you order goods out of one of the governmental funds, the general fund, you have to sit here and you have to debit encumbrances and credit budgetary control. Debit encumbrances, credit budgetary control for whatever it is you think you're gonna have to pay for that thing. Okay, now, when the thing comes in, you reverse that original budgetary entry for the original amount. So you debit budgetary control, you credit encumbrances for the original amount. So you essentially did what? You reverse this journal entry, didn't you? And then you debit expenditure and credit vouchers payable. Vouchers payable is like accounts payable, but in government, we call it voucher because we're trying to establish some sort of control over our expenditures. So we may list several expenditures on a voucher, and then I'm going to sit there and read through those, and those are all paid out on that same voucher. And so I would sign off on that. And so we would set that payable up instead of using the word accounts payable, 
often in government, we use vouchers payable. Now notice here, there's a different amount. That's okay. That 50,000 was just trying to be a placeholder for the ultimate amount that will come in on this. Now look, sometimes students will say, well, what happens now you're gonna be 500 short? Well, look, you know, we would probably fire our purchasing manager if they were so derelict that they were missing the amount by a tremendous amounts that was gonna cause us to spend more than what's available in our budget. So, you know, they live within the understanding of the budget when they order thing, but they do have some flexibility around the edges there as to what the actual amount can be, okay? Now, just to understand how this part works, notice now we have our appropriations ledger sitting here, okay? And don't worry about subsidiary ledger. We're not at that level, okay? And we have what? We have our original appropriation at the beginning of the year, we credited it, then what? Then when we make that entry right there to debit encumbrance right there, we take that debit to encumbrance and we stick it in here into our appropriations ledger. So now we know that we have what? 400,000 to go. So if somebody got crazy and said, hey, we want to order something for 440,000, we'd say, hey, buddy, stop, because we only have what? 400,000 left. So it prevents us overspending our appropriation by setting that up as a credit at the beginning of the year. And then when we order something, debit encumbrance, credit the budgetary control, so that now we have done what? We have sat there and reserved that 50,000 for this particular thing, and we won't overspend our appropriation. When the thing actually comes in, notice what we do is we, let's look at that entry. We reverse the original encumbrance by crediting it, and we debit the what? Expenditure for the actual amount. So when we take that encumbrance away, we credit it, we debit expenditure for the actual amount. And so now we know that we only have 399,500 left. That was that extra 500 for shipping charges or whatever it ended up being in that example. But now we can replace the actual expenditure with that estimated encumbrance. And again, they shouldn't be wildly different between the amount of encumbrance and the amount of expenditure. Okay, so again, when we order goods, debit encumbrance, credit this account budgetary control. Okay, then what happens? Then when the goods come in, reverse the original encumbrance entry for the original amount and set up the expenditure for the actual amount. Question. Okay, good. Let's come over them. And they talk about dual track approach here. And again, I only put that in there so I can cross it out, whatever that symbol is, crossing it out. Um, no, we do not record transactions in the government wide and the fund financial statements and then pray that somehow we'll be able to reconcile those and set up the uh, eliminating entries that we need to. We record everything at the fund level, and then we adjust up to the uh, government-wide level. So if we bought something like equipment, like that printer, and we had debited expenditure, credited vouchers payable, when we go to consolidate, we would do what? Debit equipment, credit, the expenditure, so that when we pull the consolidated statements, that would properly be shown as a long-term asset at the government-wide level. Okay, okay, good. Let's go through another round, okay, of those same thoughts that we just had, okay? So we have what? We have um, estimated revenue of 10,972. We've got appropriations of 11,360. This particular government has a deficit now, doesn't it? So we debit the deficit, okay? Then what? Then we order some goods, and as we've seen, I don't care about the subsidiary level, we debit encumbrances, we credit budgetary control for some sort of supplies in this example. Then we go ahead 
And when the goods come in, we debit the original. Um, we reverse the original budgetary entry by debiting budgetary control, crediting the encumbrances for that original 420. We debit expenditure, we credit the vouchers payable for the actual amount. Question. Okay, good. At the government-wide level, again, uh, assuming you know that you would make two different entries and two different general ledgers, which we don't do, the only difference is one, you do not do your budgetary accounting at the government-wide level. That's done at the fund level. Number two, notice we don't call it expenses. I mean, we don't call them expenditures. We call them expenses. And notice it's by the various programs that we saw in our statement of activities when we were looking at that back in chapter two. Again, you would convert your fund statements to your government wide by making the appropriate consolidating and converting entries. Okay, accounting for payroll and the I'm not going to be getting into guys making you calculate FICA and all that. I'm not interested in that at all. What I want you to understand about payroll, though, is payroll is a recurring um, expense for this government, expenditure for this government. And so they don't have to use encumbrance accounting. If the government has recurring payroll has to be met every two weeks, they simply appropriate what they need to meet their payroll and they don't have to therefore do an encumbrance because they have an appropriation that is exactly tied to what they need for their payroll. So when we deal with recurring expenditures like payroll, don't do any encumbrance accounting. It's not necessary. Okay, then you can see how they're setting up their expenditure for their payroll. And of course, some of that is going to be withholding and um, I'm not making you calculate withholding. All I want you to understand from this slide is what's in the red here, which is when one government owes another government money, we call that due to. We call that due to. When one fund owes another fund money, we call that due to. So it's not payable, it's due to. Okay, now the fund that's going to be receiving the money, they don't call it receivable, they call it due from. So we've got due to, due from. So you do need to know those account names. You don't need to worry about, well, how do I calculate FICA or anything like that? I'm not going to ask you that. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look government wide. They're going to debit expenses, and even at the government wide, even at the government wide level, it's due to tax anticipation notes are short term borrowing. Since it's short term, it will be a liability on the balance sheet. It's short term, isn't it? We don't have long term liabilities, but we would have um, the uh, short-term liability tax anticipation note and TAN on the balance sheet. That's all you need to know there. Okay, I think I want to stop there. So we're going to pick up with this inner fund activity next time. We'll finish chapter 4b and we'll see how we feel uh, and then, we, no, we won't see how we feel. We will get into chapter five and then we'll see how we feel about chapter six next time on Thursday, okay? Any question? Okay, guys, I'm gonna get you out a little bit early. Um, I think that's better than trying to put this up right now because I want us to be fresh when we look at this. Okay. So I will see you on Thursday. Thank you, Thank professor. You. Thank you, Thank you, professor. We'll see you, you, professor. Hey, before Thank we you. go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, can I ask again about the final? Yeah. Just for like my own uh, planning purposes, I know, or if I recall correctly, we had talked about like making the final uh, essentially free. We've been talking about adding material to it. 
Um, I was just wondering, like, are we taking the test and are we evaluated on it? How should we prepare? Well, what did I say? You're preparing for the final. We haven't even taken the midterm yet. What did, I, what did we say we would do? Did my say, recollection. You said we weren't going to take it? Huh? That was my recollection. Or I, I wasn't sure if we were either taking it and then getting just a full score for having done the process or if we weren't taking it. I remember it, that we were going to take it and then come back and discuss it for full credit. Yeah, that's what I remember. Oh, OK. OK, cool. Yeah, I, I just want to know what I'm in for and um, so we, be able to contribute to that to, discussion, too. I just forgot what we said. So we said we're going to take it and then come back and discuss it for full credit. So we take spend, what, like about an hour or something is what we said? Yes. Yes. OK, that's fine. So that's what we'll do then. OK, thank you, Tyler. That's a really good question. Yeah, OK. Yeah, I had forgotten about that. Uh, Professor Lord, are you speaking? I can't hear you. I said I had forgotten about that. OK, I don't know, guys. I'll see you next time. But we're good with that, OK? OK. Thank Sounds you. good. OK. See you guys. Right. Thank you, Professor. We'll talk bye -bye. about it next time. OK, bye. Professor, I, I, I scheduled my uh, bar exam finally. Oh, good. When is it? I'm taking it July 3rd.